Hi everybody, very welcome to Mentor and yet another video podcast. As always, I hope you're doing absolutely fantastic. Today on the video, guys, I'm going to give you five different tips about how to do a correct crosswind takeoff in the Boeing 737. I'm going to tell you why it's a problem in the first place, and I'm also, as always, going to show you how to do it in the cockpit. So stay tuned. This video is brought to you by our long-term sponsor, Brilliant.org. Now, Brilliant.org is a fantastic tool to help you improve on your maths, physics, and computer science skills. Uh, They even have offline mode now, if you have the app and if you have an iOS device. That means that you can sit on the subway and you can, you know, solve one of their daily challenges, you know, instead of just idly sitting on Facebook. The 501st of you who uses this link here below will get a whopping 20% off the annual fee of Brilliant, but it's completely free to check it out. Right guys, so crosswind takeoff. Crosswind takeoff is one of those things that are really, really tricky. Okay, During our line training, it's probably one of the things that takes more practice in order to get good at doing. Now, I am going to give you five different steps. So five different things that you need to think about in order to handle the crosswind properly. And after this video, I will give you an exam. Yep, you heard that right. You're going to get an exam on mentorpilot.com. There will be a quiz and there's a 75% pass rate, just like it will be on your ATPL exams. So after the video, go over there. And I want to hear in the uh, comments, I want to hear how you did on the exam. Okay. I also want to congratulate uh, Alice College, who got everything right on the exam on last week's video about the manual gear extension. Great work, Alex, but Alice is also a, um, a patron of mine, so I wouldn't expect anything less. All right, so crosswind takeoff. First thing that we're going to talk about, step number one, is planning. When you have crosswind, there is going to be a couple of things from our planet stage that you have to think about. And one of them is what kind of thrust rating you're going to use. So on a normal takeoff, we would uh, try to derate the engines as much as possible. This means that we will do a performance calculation, which by the way, I will do a video about later on. And the performance calculation will tell us how much thrust we need in order to make a safe takeoff. And we always take as little thrust as possible to make it as a safe takeoff. The reason for that is we want to save on engine life, we want to save on noise around the airport and on the environment. So it's always the professional way to do is derate the engines. There's two ways of doing that. Either you have what we call a fixed derate, which is on the 737-800, we have 26K, which stands for 26,000 pounds of thrust, 24K or 22K. So we check which one of these derates to use. And then on top of that, we also um, we can also fine tune the D rate by using com- something called a assumed temperature. Now this is called flex temperature on the Airbus, uh, but on the Boeing it's an assumed temperature. If we have crosswinds that's more than ten knots, then we are not in my company allowed to use assumed temperature. So we D rate down to the lowest possible fixed D rate. And then the extra margin, which we would have taken away with assumed temperature, we just leave in order to get some extra thrust. Now, if we do that calculation and we find out that we can't use an assumed temperature, we actually need full 22K, well, in that case, we go to the higher fixed D rate. So we go to 24K. And the reason we're doing this is because we need some extra performance. And the crosswind might go from, you know, straight crosswind to potentially a little bit of tailwind. We want to make sure that we can handle that. But also, um, we want to increase our tail margins. Okay, and I'll get to that in a second. Part of planning is also who is going to fly. So, generally speaking, both the first officer and the captain can do the takeoff. But when the crosswinds start to increase, we have realized that this is a more tricky maneuver to fly. So, uh, if the crosswind goes above 15 knots, well then, in my company, then an inexperienced first officer, that means that he or she has less than 500 hours on type, will not do the takeoff. The captain will do it. Okay? If they have more experience than that, it's actually good that they do it because they will need a little bit of exposure to it when it's time for the command upgrade. So step one, planning. Step two then, now we're getting to actual handling. Uh, Step two 
we try to do a rolling takeoff. Now you might have heard this before. A rolling takeoff is exactly what it sounds like. It means that the aircraft is not stopping on the runway. As we're entering the runway, it's a continuous rolling motion into the takeoff roll. And the reason we're doing this is because we want to avoid something called an engine surge. An engine surge is when the uh, wind, like the air, coming into the engine, since it's now straight crosswind, it's not coming in straight into the engine, it's coming in from an angle, and you might get a stall on one of the fan blades. That will cause something called an engine surge, which sounds like the engine is pumping, uh, and it's very, very bad for the engine. I'm not going to go into the technical specifics of it, but we definitely want to avoid it. By having a little bit of speed, it means that the angle that the, the air is coming into the engine is a little bit better, so we avoid that risk. We also avoid something called foreign object damage, FOD damage. Um, we, we can't avoid the risk of it, but it's at least a little bit less by doing a rolling takeoff. So we try to get the takeoff clearance before we enter the runway. We enter the runway, whilst the aircraft is moving, we stand the thrust levels up to 40%. Make sure that you get both engines accelerated up to 40% before you set the takeoff thrust, because it's going to be really important that you have symmetrical thrust when you set takeoff thrust. Step number three is control wheel inputs, all right? So, in order to control the aircraft on the ground, we normally steer the aircraft using a tiller, okay? There's a little kind of steering wheel on the left side of the captain where, you know, we can do full maximum inputs on our nose wheel. So, when we're taxiing along at lower speeds, then we use the tiller to taxi. Now, during the takeoff roll, we don't use the tiller, but we use the uh, rudder pedals instead. The rudder pedals has a little bit of, of authority on the nose wheel. So you do steer the nose wheel with the rudder pedals as well, but mainly the rudder pedals are there to control the rudder. However, the rudder is not aerodynamically effective until you reach 80 knots. So below 80 knots, when we use the rudder pedals, we're actually moving the nose gear, uh, the nose wheel, in order to maintain the center line. And in order to do so, especially if you have a lot of crosswind, you might need to add a little bit of forward pressure. So you push the control wheel forward a little bit, the uh, elevators will deflect and put a little bit of pressure, extra pressure on the nose wheel in order to get as much um, control from the nose wheel steering as possible. So this is something that we do below 80 knots. So you start the takeoff roll with a little bit of forward pressure and then as you, uh, appro you know, approach 80 knots, you can release that pressure a little bit and after that, the rudder has full aerodynamic authority and you don't need any forward pressure anymore, okay? So, forward pressure. Ailerons is the next thing. So, as you're now taking off, the aircraft is subjected to crosswind from the right in this example. You might feel that the aircraft has a tendency to bank a little bit, left or right. In this case, probably it's going to bank over slightly to the left. So you do need a little bit, you might need a little bit of aileron input into the wind. And when I say a little bit, it's because this, and this is very important guys, remember that on the 737, in order to control the roll rate, you use both ailerons, which are the little rudders on the tip of the wings, but you also use spoilers. So as you increase the input of aileron, you might get the spoilers coming up on the wing in order to help and assist the roll control. But this is not something that you want during the takeoff roll because the, the spoilers, which are also speed brakes, will increase the drag uh, and you definitely don't want that. Okay, so what we do is you only put in as much aileron as you need in order to keep the wings level. And if you go beyond one and a half units on the little scale on top of your, uh, of your yoke, well then you do get spoiler deflection. So not more than one and a half degrees. Okay, so now, you're sitting with forward pressure, a little bit of aileron into the wind. Step number four, centerline tracking. So, now, if you think about how an aircraft looks, you, you notice that at the back of the aircraft, you have this big fin, okay? At lower speeds, you know, before the rudder becomes fully aerodynamically effective, that will become pretty much like a sail, right? It will be highly affected by the crosswind. So if you have a lot of crosswind from the right, as you have in this example, well then the wind is going to push on the rudder from the right side. And while it's doing that, it means that the nose of the aircraft is going to turn into the wind. So that's called weather cocking or weather veining. Now we don't want that. You want to keep the center line. 
So in order to counteract that, you are going to have to put opposite rudder in. So if you have cross frame from the right, you're going to have left rudder in to maintain the center line. And you're going to have to modulate that depending on how much cross wind that you have. And as the speed increases, it's going to be less and less. Now be very, very careful with the rudder, guys. Uh, because if you start pumping too much, you might find yourself kind of snaking down the center line. It's going to be very uncomfortable for your passengers and very hard to control. So put smooth input into the rudder. Check where you are on the center line. If you're being drifting off a little bit, then smoothly increase a little bit more pressure. Get yourself back on the center line and hold it there. All right? Try to avoid pumping it. But this means that you're now sitting with a fairly uncomfortable combination of inputs. So you're sitting with left rudder, right aileron, a little bit of forward pressure, and struggling to keep the aircraft following the center line. So this brings us to step number five which is the rotation now the rotation this is where it becomes really complicated guys and this is where less experienced pilots tend to struggle because as you're sitting with this now you're kind of struggling the aircraft is moving all around and the 800 727 800 since it's very long it's fairly uncomfortable to keep it on the center line in this um, at higher speeds so what people tend to want to do is when they hear rotate they want to get away from the ground as quickly as possible and you have to fight that urge, all right? Because remember, as you hear the pilot monitoring now calling V1, rotate, and you start your rotation, the aircraft is gonna come up, the nose is gonna come off the runway, and eventually the main gear is gonna come up as well. The main gear has been stabilizing you up until this point, but as you get up, the full crosswind effect is now going to hit the ailerons, which means that the aircraft is going to want to turn over. You are going to need more aileron input to keep the aircraft wings level. Remember what happens when you put more aileron? Spoiler deflection. So you are now sitting with cross controls, potential slight spoiler deflection, and that margin that you had between the runway and the tail of the aircraft is going to reduce. Now this is why we put more trust in the beginning, but this is also why you have to be very careful when you do this rotation. One and a half to two degrees per second rotation continuously up at about eight to nine degrees nose up you will hear hopefully a click that click is that the weight on wheel switches on the main gear have released the runway so we've gotten off the runway that releases the up lock to allow us to take the gear up you'll hear that as a very clear click in the cockpit that indicates to you that we're now airborne continue rotation through the dead band, which is a little bit of a slower area uh, of rotation, you might need to increase the back pressure slightly through that area, um, which happens at around between seven and 10 degrees. Continue the same rotation rate all the way up to our initial pitch attitude, which is about 17 degrees normally, okay? As you're getting up through 17 degrees, you can now very, very smoothly start relaxing the pressure on your um, rudder. The aircraft is going to weather cock into the wind to find a crab angle to make sure that the track stays the same, but the aircraft is now pointing into the wind, which is how we deal with crosswinds when we're flying en route. And from that point on, this is a completely normal takeoff. So those are the five things that you have to think about. Now, let's have a look and see how this actually looks in the cockpit. And remember all of these different stages and see how it works out. Um, all right, so Lorenzo, uh, before takeoff checks below the line, please. Uh, below the line, uh, flaps. Five green light. Uh, transponder. TRA. Uh, before takeoff check is completed. Thank you. So we've got 280, 279, timing. Check. Little bit of forward pressure, a little bit of aileron into the wind. So that's 40 stabilized. Check. Set takeoff trusts. Trust set. Eighty knots. Check. V1. Rotate. Positive rate. Gear up. And 
that's all of the rudder out. Check. Hello. Hello. Come on, eh? Check. Fuck up. Check. Flaps one. Speed check. Flaps one set. Flaps up. Speed check. Flaps up, no lights. Thank you. After take off checklist, please. After take off checklist, engine bleeds are on. Packs, auto, landing gear up and off. Flaps up, no lights. And uh, altimeters. Okay, we're maintaining altitude. So QNH1005, reading 3500 feet, uh, climbing 5000 feet. Check, QNH1005. Uh, uh, after take off checklist completed. Vertical speed. Check, 1000 to level. Check. Speed up to 220 knots for the turn. Check. Right guys, so that was a crosswind takeoff stra taken straight from the cockpit. It doesn't look that complicated when you see trained people doing it, but believe me that when you're getting into your line training and it's time for you to do this yourself, it's going to feel much more complicated, okay? So, you know, feel free to go back and review this video before you go in and you do your, your own crosswind takeoff in the 737 when it's time for your line training. Now, as I mentioned before, there's going to be a test on this, okay? So, um, when you finish watching this video, then you can go into mentorpilot.com, look at quizzes, and there's going to be a quiz about crosswind takeoff. Take that and remember that it's a 75% pass rate, just like you will have on your ATPL exam when it's time for them. If you can't do it, you know, if it's below 75%, well then go in and review the video. Now, I want to take this opportunity to thank my long-term sponsor, Brilliant.org. Okay, I am really proud to have them as sponsors. I know I keep saying this, but that's because me, myself, was struggling quite a lot with especially maths when I was younger and, and I was preparing for my own ATPL training. Now, Brilliant.org uh, will have loads of different courses in there. If you go in and check out the website or their mobile app, you'll find different courses. Okay, just click on the course that you find most interesting. It might be, for example, how to um, to calculate probability using blackjack as an example, and you get to play blackjack and learn how to um, you know how to calculate probability based on that. They do it in that way. Okay, they they do it in ways that you will find interesting and that you can apply to real life, and it's really interactive. And if you do fail on something, well, then they will have a way to show you. They will give you an explanation how to think. And the next time, it will be easier for you to solve a similar problem. Okay. Now, the 500 first of you who uses this link here below will get a whopping 20% off the annual fee of Brilliant. And I highly recommend you to go in there, sign up for it, and you'll get their daily um, challenges, okay? Just use, you know, use 10 minutes of your day when you're doing your commutes or when you're sitting and idly checking Facebook or whatever. Go in, check out the challenge, see if you can solve it. And after you've done it and they've given you the ways to solve it, you will feel like a smarter and a better person, which is way, way better than what you'll feel after having spent 20 minutes idly checking Facebook. So check it out. Let me know what you think about it as well. And I will forward that to uh, my, uh, my contacts at Brilliant. Now I'm going to head over to the Mentor Aviation app, which I do every day to answer your questions, to interact with you guys. If you haven't downloaded the app already, you should definitely do it. It's completely free to do so. You have the download app um, links down here in the description of the, uh, the video. And just go there. There's some really cool stuff happening within the next month or so. So those of you who have the app and those of you who are getting the app, I think you're going to be very positively surprised. Have an absolutely fantastic day wherever you are, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.